a sneeze sort of scenario could easily have transferred this quantity of DNA from one individual to an object. Uh, 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 rubbing with a hand, gentle rubbing with a hand could easily have transferred this amount of material. It's not the amount of material that you would expect to have had if an individual had bled a large amount on a garment or had spat upon a garment or had ejaculated on a garment. Uh, those types of transfer of DNA transfer a lot of DNA in my lexicon. Uh, I, I wouldn't call what we see here a lot uh, by those types of standards okay. there. And it's entirely possible, given the way that that particular article of clothing was handled after the murder, that uh, it could have been transferred from one location on the garment to other and multiple locations on the garment. And, and I think that we need to bear that in mind when we're deciding is it important that his DNA is found on numerous places as opposed to just one or two. Uh, the, the storage, the handling of the garment after the murder itself uh, minimize or diminish the amount of weight that we can attach to the observation that the DNA is found in multiple locations. And the use of adhesive tape for the purpose of looking for fibers and hairs that might have been associated with the garment, certainly that is a valuable investigative tool that's routinely used by laboratories around the world. But uh, it also has a demonstrated capacity to be able to move material from one part of a garment to another part of a garment. And especially small amounts of material the kind of amounts of material that give rise to a positive DNA test result. First off, I, I don't think it is reasonable or correct to assert that Mr. Lau's DNA is found on the garment as the result of violent contact during the commission of a crime. That, that is not something that the DNA test results themselves support. Just that because the DNA tests are so sensitive compared to the other tests, sensitive in many respects, but particularly here in regard to contamination, uh, those samples need to be collected first, and then after you've taken portions for the purpose of DNA testing, then you can go back still and, and look to see where blood stains were and if anything be, can be gleaned about the position of knife. Uh, marks on, on the garment. Uh, it's just the sequence of the events here that is troublesome and bad practice. You, so in the final analysis, for myself, uh, I, I frankly can't distinguish between these two hypotheses. I, I can't tell you that one is more likely than the other. I can tell you that uh, I would be very uncomfortable with asserting that one is you know, the reality much, much, much more likely than the alternative. Uh, I don't. I, I can tell you quite confidently that I don't think there's enough material in the evidence samples for us to to resolve between these two hypotheses. And I would disagree then with anybody who had, who said very firmly that one or the other of these two hypotheses was much more likely than the other. Well, to to a, a judge that's involved with this particular case, what I would say is that, uh, again, the presence of a DNA profile says very little, if anything, about how or when that DNA came to be associated with an article. Uh, and in a case such as this, where there have been issues and problems with the handling of the article of clothing, whatever weight could be attached to a DNA profile being found is diminished. It may actually be diminished to the point at which it is of very little, if any, value. I, I think, quite simply, the DNA evidence doesn't speak very strongly toward guilt or innocence of Mr. Lau's. And, you know, if there has been, and I understand there has been a conviction. Uh, I, I'm hopeful that there is evidence outside of my area of expertise and outside of my awareness that makes the case because, quite simply, the DNA by itself does not.